Hello and welcome back. Today I want to start talking about transistor amplifier configurations and specifically look at the various ways in which a signal can be passed through a single transistor amplifier. Now in general the transistor has three pins and you need two pins to input the signal and another two pins to output it. So one of the pins ends up being used for both purposes. Based on which pin is common, for a bipolar transistor you get your common emitter, common collector and common base configurations, each with their own special properties. Today I will start by looking at the common collector amplifier. So if you're curious, then keep watching. The common collector amplifier is usually implemented by keeping the collector at a fixed voltage potential and the signal enters through the base and exits through the emitter of the transistor. This means the base voltage will be almost the same amplitude as the emitter voltage. The voltage gain is close to unity and because of this feature this type of circuit is also called an emitter follower. Another important thing to mention before we start is that the DC biasing of the transistor, a topic I covered in more detail in some previous videos, is somewhat independent of the configuration in which the transistor ends up being used with an AC signal. This is why in certain textbook examples the biasing is completely skipped when representing amplifiers. Now when it comes to amplification all the transistor configurations will amplify power. The output power will always be larger than the input power. Otherwise it's not an amplifier. When it comes to the common collector amplifier, this has slightly less than unity voltage gain, but it does have current gain. So this is the main use case for it, current amplification. So let's get right to it by looking at some LT Spice simulations. First things first, I will be using the BC547C transistor and first thing to check is the static operating point. So for this I used an emitter resistor coupled with a resistor divider to drive the base of the transistor. So this should provide sufficient stability to cover temperature and gain variations. Now I calculated the components for approximately 5 volts of collector emitter voltage and a collector current of 25 milliamps, so as bias point. And if we run the simulation we can check this. So first of all our collector current is about 25.8 milliamps, very close to the 25 we were intending for, and the collector meter voltage is 4.82 volts. So things are looking good so far. Next, let's look at the actual amplification behavior using some large signals. So for this, I connected an AC signal source to the input through a capacitor, and then I also have a 50 ohm load on the output, again coupled through a DC blocking capacitor. So for now we only wish to see the AC amplification and signals passing through the circuit. Now just to see how well the amplifier handles the input signals, I set multiple amplitude values for the input signal, so the frequency is static at 10 kHz, but the amplitude goes from 0.1 volts up to 2 volts. So if we run the circuit, we can see our multiple input voltages, so the amplitude increases based on the parameter value, and if we add the plot plane and also plot out the output signal, first of all we can see that both signals are in phase, so this type of amplifier is non-inverting, and if we zoom in just to have a better look at the various signals, we can see that some of the signals are not really amplified as expected. So we can see that, for example this red and blue trace, and up until this cyan trace, the 1 volt one, we see that we have a very nice sinusoid, but starting with the next signal, so the pink one which is the 1.2 volt signal, we run into a bit of trouble on the negative side. So the wave is highly distorted. However, the positive side for all waveforms looks good. So this is a limitation, although the emitter will follow the base voltage, this will only happen to a certain extent. So you can't just amplify any signal amplitude. But could this be improved? Well, sort of. So the problem that we are having is that although the transistor can pull the output voltage high, close to the supply voltage, the only thing pulling it low is the emitter resistor. 
So because of the DC operating point, the coupling capacitor will be charged with a voltage equal to the supply voltage minus the static collector emitter voltage. In other words, the emitter resistor voltage. And therefore, the minimum voltage that can be present on the load resistor is dependent on the ratio between the load resistor and the emitter resistor, which in our case is about minus one volt. That is why our one volt input signal was amplified correctly, but the higher voltage ones were running into trouble. Now, you may be thinking, how do we optimize the output voltage swing then? We could decrease the emitter resistor, but that would just increase collector current and lower gain. So that's not really good. Well, first, let's look at the maximum positive voltage swing. This will be equal to the static collector emitter voltage minus the saturation collector emitter voltage. So if we take both of these extremes into consideration and try to find out when they are equal, we can write this equation and from this we can determine the optimum bias point to get the maximum output voltage swing. So if we leave the supply voltage and resistor the same and we consider a 1 volt saturation voltage just to stay well within the linear region of the transistor, if we do this we get our static collector emitter bias point at 2.5 volts. Which also means our collector current will be about 37.5 milliamps it's slightly higher than before, but let's say it's okay. But this also means that we should be getting a slightly better output voltage swing at about plus minus 1.5 volts. If we now come back to the simulator and change the components a bit for our new static operating point, so I changed the supper resistor to 6.8 kilo ohms, we can first check that the new values are okay. So if I run the simulator, we can see our collector current at about 37 milliamps, so very close to the intended value, and the collector emitter voltage is at 2.58, so again very close to what we were expecting. We can now move on to the full amplifier, so to see how the same signals get amplified with this modification. So if we strictly focus on the output voltage, maybe just zoom in a bit, we can see that now the last signal that gets amplified fairly well is the 1.5 volt one. So only the 2 volt signal is being distorted on the negative side and all of the signals are looking good on the positive side. So by making a few adjustments we improve the large signal performance of the amplifier. And with more changes further fine tuning could be done if that is a specific design goal. Now the benefit of adjusting the bias point was not all that great. However when you actually want very large output voltage swings using common collector amplifiers, you will be going with a push-pull type of arrangement. In this case, each transistor is responsible for half of the waveform, and there is no resistor limiting the voltage swing. Depending on how it's being driven, this sort of configuration can even generate a rail-to-rail -rail output. Regardless, I will keep the single transistor optimized circuit for now, and continue with that in the next simulations. Speaking of which, let's now look at the gain of this circuit. So this time I changed from a transient simulation to an AC simulation to observe the small signal behavior and I'm simulating from 1 kHz up to 1 GHz. So to evaluate the circuit, let's take the three types of gain one at a time. Starting off with voltage gain. So if we run the simulation and we plot out the ratio between output and input voltage, we can see that this is more or less 1, so minus 200 millidecibels, regardless of input frequency. And this is somewhat understandable. The base emitter junction is working like a diode, so whatever is on the input is also on the output. Now, if we consider the input signal to be the signal before the signal source impedance, so in our first circuit I had an internal 50 ohm series impedance, with the second circuit this impedance is separated. Here if we compare the output to input voltage, we can see that the output stays flat for a while and then it suddenly drops. So at some frequency the amplifier will no longer be able to amplify and the signal source has some non-zero impedance. Once the amplifier input's impedance becomes comparable to the signal source impedance, 
the signal present at the input of the amplifier will start to drop. And also the output signal will also be dropping. So in a real use case, even though the common collector amplifier's gain is technically one, the output will start to drop with increasing frequency since the input signal will also start to drop. Next, we can come back to the initial circuit and look at current gain. So this is the ratio between the current running through the load and the current coming from the source. We can see in a similar fashion that it's quite stable up until a point and then it starts to slowly drop off. And it goes through unity through the zero decibel point somewhere in the 170 megahertz range. So the current gain of the amplifier is more or less equal to the transistor's gain. So this transition frequency is perfectly normal for this particular transistor. Finally, we can combine the two graphs, so the voltage and current gain, into a power gain graph. So I laid all three of them out here, and we can see that the combined graph, so the one for power, also shows a similar response to the current graph. So we can see again that our unity power gain point is at around 160 MHz this time. So the nice thing about this amplifier is that it will provide gain up to relatively high frequencies, and it will still keep the output signal more or less at the same voltage amplitude as the input one. At some point, since the gain does decrease in the transistor, this will have an impact on the input impedance. So eventually the output signal will end up dropping. Speaking of this, let's look at impedance next. So for this, I kept the AC type of simulation with the same frequency range, and I inserted a .NET statement to provide the network parameters, considering the output is going through R3 and the input signal source is V2. So if we now run the simulation, we can look at the input and output impedance. So these will be under the traces added by the .NET statement. And we can just rescale this a bit. We can now see the big benefit of the common collector amplifier. So we're getting a very large input impedance, something in the 4 kilo ohm range, whereas the output impedance is in the sub 10 ohm range. So at least up until a frequency where we have sufficient gain, we have this huge impedance ratio between input and output, and then the ratio slowly drops as frequency increases. So for this particular implementation, at least at low frequencies, we're getting an input to output impedance ratio of about 5600. Now, there are some formulas with which you can determine the input and output impedance of the common collector amplifier, and depending on your use case, you might want to make some adjustments. So now let's try to reduce the input impedance. We can do this by simply making the base resistor divider using smaller resistors. So I've chosen a 680 ohm resistor and a 3.6 kilo ohm one. So first things first, we can check that we have the same DC operating point so our collector current is 38 milliamps and our collector emitter voltage 2.37, so close enough. We can also check that the large signal amplification behavior is the same. So if we look at our output signal using the same input signals that we've had before, we can see that the last signal that passes unaltered is this pink one, the 1 1.5 volt one. And with higher values, we start running into distortion just like before. If we move on to the gain plot, so back to the AC simulations, I prepared the two circuits, so the old one and the new one, and we can plot out the power gain for both of these circuits. If we do this, we see a slight difference between the two curves. So by forcing a lower input impedance, we have an amplifier that has a flat response over a wider frequency range, so the corner frequency has been moved to a higher frequency. However, the overall gain is smaller than the previous amplifier. Finally, we can verify the impedance change using the .NET statement. So by doing this, we can see that our input impedance has dropped from the previous four kilo ohms down to about 500 ohms, but also the output impedance dropped from the previous seven ohms down to about 2.6 ohms. So with this new configuration, we're getting 
the lower input impedance and the lower output impedance. So having smaller resistors in the input divider will waste more of the input signal, but it will provide an amplifier that has a more stable response over a wider frequency range. So the common collector amplifier has the benefit of unity voltage gain, no signal inversion, and all of the gain is put into current amplification. This means the input impedance can be very high and the output impedance can be very low. Some common use cases of the common collector configuration are in final output stages in power amplifiers. And one example involving small signals I've heard of was guitar pickups. In the radio frequency world, this type of amplifier is useful as a buffer or isolator circuit between various circuit stages and is also used as a coax driver because of its low output impedance. Anytime your application has a large input impedance and a small output impedance, this type of amplifier configuration can be used. Now, the theory is nice and all, but next time I will also try to build this amplifier and test it out in real life just to confirm the things that we've talked about today. But for now, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated to all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.